over this past long weekend, we, we took a look at Christ's journey to the cross. And as you know, we'd set up a little journey there, which we could actually walk and, and just contemplate that which Jesus has done for us and how we are responding to that which Jesus has done. And then on the Sunday, of course, we looked at his resurrection because although Jesus was crucified on the cross, we know he's no longer on the cross. He's not in the grave. He is alive and he has ascended to his Father on high and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And we took a look at Jesus' exit from the tomb and the way he went forward and we said we too have a journey from the grave, from the tomb. For we too were dead. We were dead in our sins, every single one of us. And then we came to salvation. And when we came to salvation, Jesus raised us up spiritually from our spiritually dead state. And he called us forth from that place of deadness, the way he called Lazarus forward. Lazarus had no power to exit the tomb. He was dead. But when Jesus spoke, Lazarus could come out of the tomb. When Jesus speaks into your life, you can come out of your dead state too. And there are others out there living in a spiritually dead state. And you need to be praying for them, for Jesus to speak to them so they can come out of that place of death. But this is when our journey from the tomb begins. When Jesus calls us and we respond, we are, from that point forward, we are on a journey out of the tomb. And we walk this journey until we breathe our last breath and we get translated into another heavenly abode. And during this journey from salvation to translation, and when I use the word translation, I mean us going to heaven to be with Jesus. It is, until that time, it is a time of following Jesus on this earth. And as we follow Jesus, we are on a journey and we are on a mission. And our mission is to become more like Jesus. If you hadn't noticed, the people around you are not quite like Jesus yet. And when they look at you, they see the same thing. We are on a journey to become more like Jesus. Sometimes in our stubborn, fleshly state, we demand our own way. And it clashes with what Jesus has for us. We get stuck doing the things that we used to do. And it hinders us in our progress. Demanding our way, what does it actually mean? It means I am used to doing it a certain way and I want to carry on doing it that way. You can see how that limits your progress when you're holding on to, to an old way of doing things. It keeps your vision in the past. You're looking behind you. You can't make good forward progress when you're looking behind you. I can remember as a, a scholar in school, and the one day, we always caught a bus to and from school. Uh, we, we never got shuttled by our parents in those days. And it was a bit of a walk to the bus stop, not too bad. But this one day, my dad had said he had some stuff to do in town, and there was a, op there was a chance, a small chance, that he might be able to pick me up after school. Great. Much rather go home in my dad's car, straight to home, rather than wait for a bus, travel the bus, get off the bus, walk from the bus stop home. On this particular day, it was pouring with rain. And I was wanting to make my way to the bus stop quickly to get out of the rain. But at the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, maybe I can get, my dad's going to fetch me. And as I'm walking to the bus stop, I'm scanning like this to see, do I see my dad's car? Is he blowing his hooter or anything? And, and I'm walking fast this way, but I'm looking this way. And as I look forward, I walked into a lamppost. Dong! Yeah. You know, in the cartoons, they show stars and little things. Well, I saw stars that day. 
my great excitement looking for a possible trip home in my dad's car turned into a big knop on the head as I walked into a lamppost. And we need to remember that saying which says, stop looking behind you, you're not going that way. You've heard that statement? How often we want to look behind us. In our hearts, we want to move forward. But in our thinking, we're looking behind us. Don't be like me. Don't walk into a lamppost and see stars. If God wants you to see stars, then you just look up at night. But forget about the lamppost. One of them. But one of the key aspects of making progress spiritually is the fact that we became new creations at salvation. We need to seek that newness instead of holding on to the past. In 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How well have you embraced the new you? Think, think back to how you used to be and how you are now, and I'm sure you can see change. But how well have you embraced the fact that you are a totally new creation in Christ Jesus? And if you are in Christ, which I take it the majority of you are, you are that new creation. The old aspects of you have passed away. Stop trying to do CPR on them and resurrect them. They are done with. Jesus died on the cross so that you can be free of those things. Let them go. Stop trying to resurrect them. All things have become new. Embrace that new. Walk in it. Say, thank you, Lord, that you've done a new thing. I can remember back as well, I'm reminiscing today, aren't I, a little bit? When, and I've told you before, when I was younger, I, I was unable to speak like this in front of people. I didn't have a good self-image, but God did a new thing. When God filled me with His Spirit, He said, that is done away with, boy. Forget that stuff. You're going to stand in front of people and speak. And I laughed. That wasn't me, but it was a new me. Did I embrace it? Yes, I did. Was it easy? No, because inside I felt like the same old. If I, just, if I hang on to that same old, I would never be standing here speaking to you. We've got to embrace the new that God has done within you. You've got to embrace it. You are a new creation. You've got to flow in the new creation. God has purpose for your life. I never thought God would be able to use me. I didn't have that kind of an image. I, I mean, I didn't have that thinking. I didn't think I had anything to offer God. He took me. Like this. He said, come boy, come. Because I was holding back. We need to get to know the new me, the new you. You need to familiarize yourself with it. You need to flow with it. Sure, it's different and it gets, gets some getting used to. You've got to step out of old mindsets. You've got to step out of old molds because the old mindset is trying to keep you there. He's trying to keep you in one place. The enemy is saying, no, that's your place. That's your black blade are. Keep quiet. Shut up. That's what the enemy wants. And God is saying, come, give me your hand. Come, I'm helping you up. Come on. I've given you a new, a new voice. I've given you new eyes to see. I've given you new ears to hear. I've given you a new heart to feel. Flow in it. Flow in the new you. Embrace that which God has done within you and flow in it. To move into something new, you have to let go of the old. 
You can't trade your old car in for a new one and still demand to drive your old car. It's not yours anymore. You've sold it. It doesn't belong to you. Jesus has paid the price for you. The price has been paid. It doesn't belong to you anymore. You've got to flow with the new. You've got to get to know that new car. Familiarize yourself with it. Sure, it is different. It takes a a, a bit of getting used to. But it's going to take you to a new, safer, better level in your traveling. You can't hold on. Once you've traded that car in, you can't hold on to it. You've got to let it go. It will have a new owner. You have got something new. Enjoy the new. Holding on to the old limits you in embracing the the new you. Holding on to your old thought processes, your old thought patterns, prevents you in the renewing of your mind. Your mind is the place where all your decisions are made. You make those choices. What are you going to do? If it's not renewed, guess what? You're just going to be making old choices. But a renewed mind can make new choices, better choices, higher quality choices, safer choices. Your decisions dictate your actions. And your actions, they form your future. And if we stubbornly hold on to the way we used to function in the past, then what hope of progress is there on moving forward? Nothing. We'll just have more of the same. And I'm sure many of you saying, it's enough. I don't want more of the same. I want something new. It's already been done. It's up to us to embrace it. It's up to us to take those old thought patterns and they will keep popping up, but you take them and you say, no, that is old, that is done. That is so 2020. So we need to recognize that your old way of functioning was not in line with God's will for your life. Mine wasn't. My old way of functioning was what my flesh wanted me to do. But God has a higher calling for us. We need to step out of that. There is more for you if you allow God to weave it into your life. He knows the future from the past. And this brings me great comfort. Because I don't know what tomorrow holds, never mind next year. But God is already He's already in eternity. He knows everything from today right through eternity. He knows. I can trust him. I can put my faith in him. I can let go of my safety thing. You've seen a little little child growing up and sometimes they have a safety blankie or a a teddy bear or something that they just want to hold on to. It is security because it's familiarity. Sometimes the familiarity of the old way of of functioning is like a comfy blanket to us because we hang on to it. We need to let go, let it go, and embrace that which God has for you. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the transforming of our thinking is a result of the renewing of our mind. How well are you partnering with God on the renewing of your mind? Consider this. Something goes wrong in your life. Many things go wrong in our lives. How do you react to that situation? Do you react the same way that you used to react before salvation? Or are you reacting differently? Do you have a renewed mind that allows you to function differently? When someone treats you unfairly, and and I'm sure if we start from this side to that, you've all been treated unfairly. Hey, Kyle, I know you have sometimes. When someone treats you unfairly, Do you still respond the same way you used to before salvation? Because that is an indication of where we're at. 
It's when things go wrong and get tough that we get to see the real progress we've made. When everything is going well and everyone is being pleasant with you, it's easy to think that we have changed and made progress. But have we? In this church, if everyone is nice to you on a Sunday, you come here the first Sunday, everyone's pleasant, nobody has said anything funny, you think, wow, this is a great church. And then you come the next week and somebody says something. And you want to fight them. You want to climb out your car and have some road rage before you even get off the property. That, those are the times that tell us, wow, what's happening inside here? I need to take stock because I am a new creation. Why am I still f functioning and flowing in old ways? When a student is in school, they go through a whole trimester, a whole term, and they are receiving lectures and reading books, and they can think that they've got everything in hand, everything that they've heard, they've maybe understood. But it's only when they sit down for the test with no open books, with no teacher to guide, when it's just them and the exam paper, that is when they know what they've learned. The challenges of life are like those exam papers. Every now and again, we sit down to write an exam. Somebody is in your face. Maybe they're swearing at you. Maybe they are cursing at you on the road or whatever it is. You're sitting in an exam. How well are you going to pass that exam? Because those are the times when we can really see what progress we've made. When everything is going well, we can think everything's hunky-dory and I've made some good progress. But it's only during the tough times, only to the, through the times of challenge that we can really test what is going on on the inside. We need to embrace those circumstances to say, Lord, every time I fail this test, I'm going to have to rewrite it. I'm going to have to go around this mountain again and again and again. Help me to pass the test. Have you noticed in school, I don't know if it's still like that these days, but when I was at school, if you didn't pass standard eight, you set it again. You didn't just go up. You didn't get promoted. You set it until you passed it or that you just threw in the towel and, and gave up. So is life. You'll sit that same test, whether it's a test of patience, whatever it is, you will sit that test over and over and over and you need to pass it. And even when you pass it, it might present itself again. But once you've passed it once, it gets easier to pass it again. You might get 90% the first time, and then it comes again, and you get 93, and then 95, until you've really got it under the belt. It's when things get tough that we really can see if we've made progress or not. All our functioning, how we respond, how we react, the words we speak, everything we feel on the inside, that is what's going on in the heart of us. Our central being, where we think and make decisions, that is who we actually are. Our legs and our feet, they don't get to decide where they're going. We decide that in our central core, we decide that. If I want to climb down the stairs here, it's not my legs and feet that decide it. My legs and feet just do that which I have decided they must do. My hands, they will pick up that which in my inner core I have decided, pick this up. The hand and the arm is only responding to that which I have decided. Our mouths speak that which is going on on the inside. It is expressing what we're feeling on the inside. My mouth doesn't just speak by itself. It flows from what is inside. Out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our whole body is merely responding to the inner decisions that we have made. And I need you to catch this. The inner decisions and the subsequent directives that are given. Hand, do this. Leg, do this. Mouth, say this. Every limb 
and extremity is merely carrying out the directives that have been determined inside of us. Inside here and processed through this mind. And if this central processing unit is not transformed and renewed, then nothing has really changed. I can learn to speak friendly words, but I might still have hatred in my heart. God is not looking for modified behavior. He's not saying, you better behave better. God is saying, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because as you're transformed on the inside, everything else will just fall into line. God is not looking for modified behavior. That is religion. Religion will tell you, don't do this, don't do that. You better do this, you better do that. Modified behavior. God's looking for a new creation. And the nice thing is, He does it all. We've just got to respond. How well are we responding to that which God has already done? To the people around me, my words may appear to define them as a friend. But that's because they can't see what's happening on the inside. People can be deceived by masked actions, but God sees on the inside. God sees your motives. God sees your heart. God looks right at the heart. He knows exactly what's going on on the inner core. And that's what he is interested in. Because one day, I stand before him. Is it this body that will stand before him? Is it these fleshly hands, feet, mouth, this physical body? No, this stays behind. What my hands and feet have done and what my mouth has said is only a result of what has happened on the inside. And it is the inside, us as spirit beings, the stand before the Father. That which God sees on the inside of you is what will stand before Him. All of this other stuff that can be masking and deceiving, that stuff stays behind. We will stand transparent before God when we are judged. None of your flesh will inherit eternal life. Only the inner you goes to be with the Lord. Can you see the importance of genuine change in your heart and in your mind? Genuine change is that which happens inside of you at a soul level. Aspects of you which really count as they are the only aspects which have eternal significance. This new creation thing is God's plan. It's not thought up cleverly by some man. This is God's plan. And unless we are a new creation in Christ Jesus, we have nothing to offer God whatsoever. He's not looking for modified behavior. He's looking for a complete new you. And He wants you to embrace it and to flow with it, and for His Spirit to empower you and enable you to, to get past all of that stuff of the flesh that we battle with. It's all through Him. But unless you embrace Him, and unless you flow with Him, it doesn't happen. It won't help one day to stand before God and try to explain how careful you were to always Say the right thing, not to say what was happening inside of you. I always watched my words, even to those that I hated and I wanted to destroy. Or how often I've washed my hands and kept them nice and clean. These hands aren't going to heaven, folks. Good hygiene is a godly trait. I'm not disputing that. But it's not that that God's looking for. God is looking for something much deeper. Watching what you say is an important part of the Christian walk. But if those things that you're saying is not happening on the inside, what do we have to offer our God? Think of this. You look around and you see bad governance or bad leadership, and it results in bad followers and a bad system. And we, there's a term we use that says the fish rots from the head down. I'm sure you've heard of that term. 
Well, we have a similar thing in a person, except that we rot from the core out. It's the core that is important. What is happening in your core? You would not appreciate being served rotten fish on a plate that has a piece of lettuce leaf hiding the front head, and you're expected to eat the rest of the fish. That wouldn't be appetizing at all. Neither does God seek rotten hearts which have been whitewashed to look clean. He's looking for a renewed mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He has already provided everything on the cross, everything needed to wash every single one of our hearts as white as snow. Anything less misses the mark. That is exactly what we were remembering this past long weekend. God has called us out of our Egypt into something new. And we could go through life with our hearts still in that Egypt, still longing for the old life, still thinking, oh, it was so nice getting high, getting drunk, whatever it was, whatever your Egypt was. But is that what Jesus died for? For followers who are yearning to go back to where he called us out from. A partial conversion, but with no inner change, no inner impact, no new you. I think not. Especially when I read such scriptures as John 10.10, 10, where Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. What does the Amplified Bible say? To have it super abundantly. If Jesus paid the price for me to have super abundant life, I want that super abundant life. I don't want to go back to what I left behind. I want a complete work, not a partial work. How could a perfect, finished work of God result in only a partial result? By us only partially embracing it. And having hearts and thoughts that are still stuck in the old life. Still stuck in the old Egypt that he called us out of. Stuck in the old way of doing things. God didn't call the Israelites out of Egypt to get them stuck in the wilderness. They got stuck for 40 years because of a lack of faith. God didn't call you out of your old life to spend 40 years going around the wilderness. He called you out to bring you in. There is a transition process, sure. We're all in that transition process of becoming more like Jesus. But are we? Have we embraced it? Have we embraced the renewing of our minds so that we can actually do this walk that He's called us to? Even though the promised land was promised, they still had to fight through the enemies who wanted to wipe them out. They had to wipe out the enemies. What enemies are you still fighting through and wiping out? Because there are enemies in our life when we come out of our Egypt. Are you actually doing that? Overcoming your opposition? Or are you partnering with the enemy? Following Jesus, but partnering with the enemy? Are you consciously identifying those enemies that, that come in, that want to bring you back, pull you down? Those enemies which are agents of Satan, as it were, trying to stop your progress. The enemies of the Israelites, of when God sent Moses to bring them out of, of Egypt, when they had left Egypt, it was the same Egyptians that wanted to bring them back. It, so initially, it was the same enemies that they encountered. Those that had held them in bondage, it was the same ones that wanted to take them back into captivity. The same enemies that you had that were holding you in your Egypt, in your previous life, quite quite possibly, are the same ones who want to come after you to bring you back into bondage. What did you used to battle in your old life? Addictions? Anger? Pornography? There's a thousand and one things that it could be. But that is a weakness that you had. 
And the enemy knows your weakness, and he's going to try and attack you in your weakness. So you come out of your Egypt, you come to salvation, you're following Jesus, and all of a sudden you're feeling overwhelmed by the, the old things. The old enemy is trying to take you back. Allow God to drown out your enemies. But you've got to partner with him. You've got to allow him to renew your mind. Because if your mind is not renewed, guess what? It's got an old way of thinking. And it's easy for the enemy to pull you back. But don't be surprised when the enemies of old come, come back knocking, trying to get your attention back. Be careful not to invite them in by falling to their temptations. Do not give in to their knocking. Remember, all things have been made new. You can't have the new if you're hanging on to the old. You've got to let go of the old. What have you been hanging on to? God's trying to help you to move forward, but you're being raptured upside down, as it were, you know, hanging on to this worldly stuff. What are you hanging on to of your old life? That God is saying, it's not part of the new you. You've got to let it go. You've got to cut with that stuff. You've got to drop it. What God has for you is far better than what you had in the past. You can trust your God. Place your faith in Him. Place your whole life in Him. He's got your back. Now last week, when I, I ended last week's servant, Service And I said there's three main aspects which we are to master in order to have a victorious Christian walk. Now, my intention was to speak of the first of those this week, and that was hearing God's voice. God willing, I will speak on that next Sunday. But as I was trying to prepare that message of hearing God's voice, I couldn't prepare it because of this message. I was so led to, to put this message together that I couldn't I couldn't prepare the message I had intended. Now, when that happens to me, I recognize that God is saying something here that he once said today. Not next week, not in three weeks' time. He wants it today. This message is for all of us, but it's specifically for some. I don't want you to miss what God is saying. You need to take this seriously, folks. You need to take what God is saying here today. Because this was not what I prepared, not what I planned to speak on. It wasn't even in my thinking when I sat down to prepare this message. It just flowed in this direction. So please embrace it and say, yes, Lord. Maybe watch it again when I get it out on, on WhatsApp later. Maybe watch it again. But make sure you don't miss what God is saying. Because I promise you, God is speaking this message to people in this place today. And Heavenly Father, we just want to offer ourselves up to you. Would, you. would you weave this message within us, Lord? Would you help us not to just brush it off and say, yeah, well, that was another message and I can carry on with my week. Lord, let this message not stop ringing in the hearts of your people. Lord, may it reverberate in our hearts that, that you want us to be new creations. You've, you've paid the price. You have done it. You just need us to walk in it. You're not looking for modified behavior. You're looking for a new me. You're looking for my mind, to, for me to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And I give you my mind, Lord. I give you. I offer it to you. And I ask that you cut off, Lord, circumcise that mind, as it were, on, of anything, Lord, that does not belong, and help me to be renewed in my mind and in my thinking and as I move forward, Lord. And I speak that prayer, Lord, for, for each one of us that is grasping onto this that you have said today, that you, Lord, as we hand you our heart and our mind, that you would just cleanse it, Lord, from the things of the past. You've washed our heart, Lord, as white as snow. And we offer you our mind that it can be in line, Lord, with our new spirit and our new heart. Let it all be in sync with you, Lord, that we may run as a new creation and be a blessing to others and bring glory to your name. 
I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm -hmm.